most people in the 4x4 community are fairly new to the lifestyle. You know, even most of the big 4x4 YouTube influencers that are out there right now haven't really been doing it for very long. Unfortunately, many of these new 4x4 influencers and experts tend to give really bad advice, in my opinion. Most people go out and they get a Jeep, a, a Toyota, or even a rock buggy, and they throw tons of money into it, wheel it, you know, for anywhere from five to ten years, and then just move on to another hobby. You know, most Americans have a bad habit of just jumping from hobby to hobby, and I probably see this more in the off-road community than, uh, than any other uh, hobby a guy could have. But some of us are lifers to the 4x4 lifestyle, and I hope you'll be a lifer too. My dad was an avid off-roader going back to the 1960s, and I got my first 4x4 in high school in the 1980s, and I've been off-roading ever since. I did my first Jeepers Jamboree in 1992, and, you know, I was running Johnson Valley in the early days of uh, the Hammer Trails back there in the late 90s. I've had numerous really built full-size trucks on big tires, you know, Toyotas, rock buggies, and I'm currently even on my fourth Jeep. My wife's on her third Jeep. I'm going to share some of my hard-earned wisdom that I've learned during the last 35 years of off-roading. This video is going to be part one of a series of videos, and the topic of this first video is going to be building a 4x4. And the first thing you need to do is decide what type of off-roading you want to do. And yeah, there's a lot of different types of off-roading, and some of them cross over a little bit, too. And a lot of this is going to depend on your locality. Um, you know, if you live in, uh, let's say, uh, back east, particularly in the south, you're going to be running in a lot of mud, uh, you know, with some tree roots and slick, wet, mossy rocks thrown in there for good measure. And... You know, you, you, you're you going to want to rig with uh, big mud tires and probably a lot of horsepower for something like that. Um, if uh, you live in uh, the western states, you know, you're probably going to want a rock crawler, something more geared towards rock crawling. Um, you know, if you live in the Midwest or maybe Alaska or Canada or something like that, maybe you're more drawn towards an overlanding type rig. And... The vehicle you got by is going to depend on uh, uh, which one of these things you're going to primarily do. You know, back east, and then, you know, at the extreme end of the spectrum, a lot of people just jump right in and buy a rock bouncer or a rock buggy to do a lot of the more extreme stuff. And I kind of recommend against that because it's better to get a smaller rig to start with, uh, you know, a, uh, a street legal rig. Uh, and you know, learn to drive, learn to spot, you know, learn to wrench on it, you know, learn the fundamentals and basics before moving up to a, uh, a, a buggy. And that's my recommendation. And my last piece of advice for you when uh, you're selecting your new off-road rig is you'll be way ahead of the game by getting an automatic transmission. I'm not joking with that either. You know, I, I spent the first, uh, uh, 15, 16 years of my uh, journey in the off-road lifestyle with a stick shift. And, you know, I got to the point where I was putting uh, hand throttles on my stick shift for rock crawling. And I remember the first time I bought my JK and had my first automatic transmission, it was like uh, I'd entered a different world. So I highly recommend that when you're looking for an off-road rig, especially if you're going to be doing any rock crawling, get an automatic transmission. You'll, uh, you'll thank me for that. It would be great if we can all start off-roading on 42-inch tires, one-ton axles, Atlas transfer cases, and top shelf parts all around. But the reality is that most people can't do that. Most of us start small and gradually build our rigs up as funds allow you know, or experience or welding or fabrication skills uh, get better. And this is a good thing because it helps you learn to be a good driver 
and helps you learn how to work on your own stuff. So let me give you some tips on building your 4x4. The first thing you need to do is protect your investment, and that means some armor. Skid plates and sliders are mandatory on most rigs. Just remember, nerf bars and runners are not sliders, so get a set of real rock sliders. Do not ever buy full-length bumpers for your Jeep or bumpers that prevent your front tires from contacting big rocks. The most frustrating thing you can do is spot someone through rocks that has a big ass front bumper. You want this space right here clear so it can make contact with rocks and climb over them. When it comes to bumpers, less is better. But not all 4x4s have these awesome dovetailed front ends from the factory like a Wrangler or a CJ does. You know, a lot of rigs the uh, edge of the body actually comes out to the edge of the tire right here. So you can't run a stubby bumpers on, the, on those. But you guys that uh, have uh, Cherokees or Broncos or Toyotas, just make sure that the uh, edge of your bumper actually comes up and gets thin as it goes out to the uh, edge of the sheet metal right there. That way you have plenty of room to put your tire on rocks. Remember, less is better. All you really need a front bumper to do is hold a winch and have attachment points. And that's it. <laughs> After that, you need the bumper to stay the hell out of your way. You could see that none of our bumpers on our rigs block the tires. Rear bumpers should be minimalists and offer protection without adding unnecessary weight. I like a bumper that has options for uh, carrying a spare tire when you want to, but you could also remove it when you don't want to run a spare tire. With modern tire repair systems and bead locks, I pretty much progress beyond the need to carry a spare tire most of the time, but you should always run a spare tire if you're not an expert at trail repairs. When you get there, all a rear bumper really needs is attachment points. And next, you need to figure out what tire size you want to run. Tire size will determine your lift height, your gearing, and how much you'll need to build up your axles. From this point on, your whole build will revolve around tire size. The big mistake that most newbies make is throwing on big tires without building up or upgrading their axles. If you want to run stock axles on most 4x4s, 33-inch tires are usually the maximum you can safely run. But, you know, vehicles like the, the new Wranglers, Gladiators, Broncos, and Tacomas are usually okay with 35-inch tires with your stock uh, uh, stuff on there if you get the right package. Um, as long as you're careful, you're a careful driver too. But if you keep your factory axles, it's very wise to install chromoly axle shafts in those axles. Broken axle shafts or front axle components are the number one problem on the trail. Also, make sure you have the tools and the knowledge to repair a broken axle shaft on the trail. Most people don't. If you want to run 35s and possibly even 37s, I highly recommend something with at least Dana 44 strength. And most Toyota axles are about Dana 44 strength. When you run tires larger than 37s, particularly when you make that step up to 40s, it's time for one ton axles. Never run tires over 33 inches if you have the dreaded Dana 35 in the rear. We call Dana 35s trail tampons. <laughs> They're that bad. So before you go out and buy your big ass tires and a lift kit to match it, make sure that your axles are built to handle it. Watching people constantly throw thousands of dollars into Dana 30s just breaks my heart. Big tires are also 
going to demand lower gearing in your axle. So be prepared for that expense as you plan your axle upgrades. Lower gear ratios, which are numerically higher, often mean that you'll need a new carrier or thick cut gears that match the carrier brake. There's also limits to how low you should uh, regear your axle. Gear mesh and pinion size suffer when your gear ratio gets too low for the ring gear diameter. The limit of a Dana 30 should be about 488 gears. A Dana 44 is pretty strong up to 513 gears, and a Dana 60 is safe beyond that. Yes, they do make 538 gears for a Dana 30, but that's a horrible idea to install, um, and you get a, a super tiny pinion on it. Don't do anything like that. You also might have to go with aftermarket uh, knuckles and ball joints. You might have to gusset your C's and sleeve or truss your axle tubes. You know, it adds up fast, and experienced off-roaders are always telling the new guys you never polish a turd. And throwing thousands of dollars into a Dana 30 or a Dana 35 is polishing a turd. In the end, if you know how to weld and do some minor fabrication work, the cheapest option for an older 4x4 is to upgrade to junkyard one-ton axles. You know, they'll be twice as strong as your stock axles, and it's usually cheaper to build a junkyard axle than it is to modify your factory axle. Technically speaking, lockers probably should have been covered in the axle chapter, but I'm giving them their own chapter because they're so important. Most noobs screw up when selecting their first set of lockers, and many so-called experts in the industry just give horrible advice when it comes to lockers. Contrary to what people tell you, your front locker is the most important locker, not your rear. Your front locker does most of the work off-road. If you can only afford one locker, always get a front locker. Rear lockers are helpful when you climb steep dirt or mud hills um, because it transfers all the weight to the back and, you know, helps you get traction. But that's pretty much it as far as the importance of a rear locker goes. Other than that, your front locker is responsible for conquering most obstacles. Your front tires are the first point of contact with any obstacle. And when your front tire contacts an obstacle, it must climb over that obstacle in order to, uh, to conquer it. So in essence, the front axle pulls your rig over things. You know, and if you don't have a front locker, your wheel is just pushing against the obstacle without climbing it. And this causes a lot of uh, drivetrain wear and broken axle parts. Auto lockers are popular in the front axle when you have locking hubs. When your hubs are unlocked on the street, you don't notice a locker up there at all. But selectable lockers are popular when you don't have locking hubs. For a trail only rig, that's basically a trailer queen, any locker or spool is fine for the rear of your 4x4. But for a rig that sees any street time, a selectable locker or a limited slip is better in the rear axle than, a, than an auto locker is. And you don't want your rear axle locked on the street. It's, you know, a lot of people say, oh, it's, it's okay, you don't even notice it. But that's not exactly the truth, is it? <laughs> Especially when it comes to tire wear. You also don't want a locked up rear end on snow or ice. When you see people sliding off the side of the trail on snow runs, they usually have their rear axle locked or, you know, they're running an auto locker back there and they just have no control. I got a little secret for you guys too. Everyone thinks that Beck and I run lockers in the rear of our Jeeps, but uh, we don't. We actually run Detroit True Track limited slips in the rear of our Jeeps. And I've done that in my Jeeps for about 20 years now. When I tell people that, they never believe us because they see both rear tires spinning at the same time. Well, if you use some limited slips correctly, you can use slight brake pressure to get the rear tires to actually lock up.
Becca and I have taken our Jeeps through most of the hammer trails, you know, including trails like SOS. And, you know, we've ran all the non-buggy trails at San Hollow in our Jeeps. We've tackled trails like the Rubicon Trail, uh, Ford Ice, Swamp Lake, Doozy, and Pritchett Canyon in our Jeeps without an issue. In fact, most people say that Becca and I run way too fast when we do trails. And this is all with a front locker and a rear true track. That true track in the rear is also fantastic on the street. You don't even notice it. And it's absolutely impossible to beat in the uh, snow, ice, and sand. The true track is also a gear-driven limited slip. So it has no clutches that wear out and contaminate your diff fluid. So for a rig that sees street and trail time, put a locker in the front and a true track in the rear, and you'll be thanking me later. And the next thing on your build list should be steering. <laughs> you know, factory tie rods on any 4x4 that you buy off the lot aren't going to last long. And that goes for both solid axle and IFS vehicles. You know, uh, just like the blade on a bulldozer plows dirt, your tie rod's going to be plowing through rocks. And often, just the stress of turning big tires in the rocks is enough to bend or break a factory tie rod. So always get an aftermarket chromoly or aluminum tie rod with heavy duty rod ends on it. This goes for tie rods on uh, IFS rigs too, which actually have a higher failure rate when it comes to steering than the solid axle vehicle. So it's important with, uh, with all types of vehicle to upgrade that tie rod or tie rods. Factory drag links can also be really weak, so those often need upgrading. Many companies sell tie rods and drag links as a package set to save money, and that's always a good idea in my opinion. When you get to 37-inch tires and greater, you'll notice that it's really hard to turn your wheels and your, your steering wheel in the rocks. You know, sometimes it's absolutely impossible, and you have to back out of what you're doing and try again. This is the point where... Hydro Assist steering is an absolute game changer. Hydro Assist takes almost all the stress off your steering components and really helps them last. And lastly, we need to discuss steering braces and things like that. Some rigs, you know, like, like XJs, older Cherokees, have no real frame. And some vehicles have very weak frames. And this can cause the frame to bend or crack. In, as far as the uh, steering components go. Um, or like with XJs, sometimes the, the steering box might rip right off. Many rigs require steering braces or some type of frame stiffener to prevent that from happening. Now we get into the centerpiece of the rig and the item that the whole rig is built around, and that's the tires. Where and what you will will determine what type of tire you want to buy. Guys back east might want Swampers. Guys out west might want BFGs. Overlanders might want Falcons. And people who want the best uh, DOT radial tire for rock crawling will be running the Niddle Trail Grapplers or the uh, Toyo Open Countries. <laughs> Buggy guys will probably want Reds or Treps, or if you're back east, probably the TSL SXs. So I won't get into tire types or tire brands in this video. But generally, if you want to do some tougher trails, get a mud terrain tire that hooks up in the type of terrain that you're going to wheel in. For an all-purpose rig, make sure that you don't get a tire that's too wide. Wide tires can actually work against you in the rocks due to uh, contact patch PSI. And really wide tires might, you know, hit your bumper, links, or frame while you turn your front wheels, which is bad. And the rolling resistance of wider tires also causes poor fuel economy and increased wear on your steering and drivetrain components. Also, don't get ghetto-ass, low-profile wheels and tires for your rig. Lots of sidewall is actually a good thing for off-road. 
we often climb obstacles on nothing but our sidewalls, and we rely on our sidewalls to bite on rocks a great deal while we're off-roading. We also air down and want lots of tire flex, which requires plenty of sidewall. Another downside to low-profile tires is that they ride very rough on dirt roads and translate a lot of vibration and wear to your suspension. And lastly, if you run ghetto-ass rims and tires on your Jeep, we're going to make fun of you. A 17-inch wheel, like you see on both of these, is perfect for tires up to 40 inches, and 18 or 20-inch wheels can be used for tires 40 inches and bigger. Even the current Rubicon comes with 17-inch wheels because that's almost the, the perfect wheel size for us. 17-inch wheels will clear almost any brake system and still provide enough sidewall to be fantastic off-road, so that's what I recommend. Also, stay away from really wide wheels. An 8- or 9-inch wheel is perfect for off-roading, in my opinion. When you go wider than a 9-inch wheel, you often lose beads when you air down and uh, get a lot more wheel damage in the rocks. And lastly, wider wheels will lower your tire height and nobody wants that. So get an eight to nine inch wide wheel. Also learn about wheel backspacing. When you install bigger tires, you need wheels that push the tire out further so nothing rubs while you steer or flex your rig. Most factory wheels have about six or more inches of backspacing and you want much less than that. Most people want about four and a half inches or less of backspacing on their four by four wheels. I like bead locks, not only because I can air way down, but because it makes emergency tire repair a lot easier for me. But they can be a pain in the ass, so don't automatically jump on them. They're very time consuming to mount and unmount. Bolts break around the, the, the lock ring. Uh, balancing tires can be a problem with bead locks. They require routine maintenance and they're very expensive. So don't let get bead locks unless you're absolutely sure that you need them. Ideally, you should always do your tires and lift at the exact same time. Because this is the only way that you're going to be able to adequately set, set your bump stops up, uh, get your pinion angle right. Uh, handle your driveline needs, handle your steering stops, and do a full alignment on your vehicle. But the biggest mistake people make is getting too high of a lift. You want to have a rig with a really low center of gravity. I can tell you that over my decades of off-roading, one of the tidbits of wisdom I've learned is that being stable on the trail is more important than things like uh, belly clearance and flex. Also, the higher your lift is off the ground, the more steering issues and driveline issues you're going to have ultimately. The new Wranglers and Broncos, I think, are pretty awesome in this regard because they allow you to run big 37-inch tires with just, you know, two to three inches of lift on them. And this puts you way ahead of the game compared, you know, for instance, to what I had to do back in the old days with my old uh, YJ. Becca's Gladiator is running 37s with a two and a half inch lift and it uh, it rides like a like a stock Jeep down the road. It's perfect. But generally, install the lowest lift you can get away with that still clears the tires well and allows adequate shock up travel. And the second biggest mistake I see people make with lifts is improper bump stop setup. Bump stops are the most important and overlooked components of a lift kit, in my opinion. Never trust the height of the bump stops that come with a, a, a packaged lift kit. Not only can improper bump stop height cause suspension damage, it can also damage tires, body panels, and even break axle shafts. Here's a video of my buddy Steve breaking an axle shaft due to having bump stops that were too short for his lift and tire combination. You'll see in this video that his front passenger tire was wedged up into his fender, which prevented that tire from turning and broke the axle shaft on that side. Oh. Oh! oh. So improper bump stops 
cause all kinds of problems, yet most people neglect them. Don't do that. To set your bump stops up properly, you need to flex the vehicle out till the opposite wheel almost comes off the ground a little bit. Very few people actually do this and, you know, they normally break parts and end up not understanding why. It's the bump stops. A winch is not mandatory if you're running with a group of people, but it's something you'll eventually want to buy after you get your armor, axles, steering, lift, and tires finally done. I've literally seen a hundred winches fail in my lifetime. Admittedly, half of them were Smitty built winches, but the overwhelming majority of the rest of them were also cheap Chinese winches. Everyone thinks their Chinese winches are great until they aren't. Treat a winch like a safety item because when your rig is hanging by a rope, safety is a concern. Buy an American made worn winch, one of the USA made worn winches, and just be done with it. The failure rate on these USA made worn winches is just extremely low. Also, for the last 15 years, I've used nothing but synthetic line. So synthetic line is a lot safer and easier to deal with, in my opinion. So even though it's more expensive, it's definitely worth the money. Low gearing gives you multiplied torque, and there's no more effective way of getting lower gearing than through your transfer case. Many Jeep owners swap in a Rubicon case or maybe an Atlas transfer case, and many people with those small displacement Asian engines run double cases. And some people with transfer cases that have high gearing from the factory might run a doubler. But here's a mistake that people often make. There's a point where the gearing is so low that it just really sucks for off-roading. I've seen rigs that can't go over four miles an hour and four low. And that really sucks on a trail run. I had a doubler in a Jeep that gave me a 7.4 to 1 gear ratio, and I couldn't even use my brakes when that doubler was on, and I just broke parts like crazy every time I used it, so I really hated that thing. Also, when your gearing is too low, you won't feel it when a tire is bound up or wedged in a rock, and uh, the axle will just keep spinning until something breaks, so really low gearing causes a lot of parts to break. So choose your gear ratio wisely if you get an aftermarket transfer case. Off-road lighting should literally be the last thing you spend money on, honestly. You can run any trail on the planet with your factory headlights and high beams. That's right, you can run any trail on this planet with your factory headlights and high beams. And if you run in a group, you know, like most people do when they off-road, you probably won't even be able to use your expensive off-road lights because you'll blind the rig in front of you. If you do get, you know, a light bar or, you know, some other type of lighting system, something small and reliable is really all you'll need. You know, I don't like lights that mount on the hood, the cowl or the lower A pillars on rigs because they cause way too much glare off the hood. I think it's a horrible spot to mount the lights. Uh, rock lights, popular out west here. Rock lights are also a consideration. I personally like rock lights because they help me spot better in rock gardens, and they come in handy when you need to do repairs at night. But rock lights definitely aren't mandatory. You can live without them. But uh, never, ever spend money on lights when you need rock sliders, axles, lockers, and gears. That's, you know, that's shit overlanders do. Don't do that. An aftermarket roll cage is never a bad idea for an off-road rig. A well-designed, full custom cage is best, but even one of those cheaper sport cages you know, gives increased protection over what came from the factory. I've personally seen them save lives. I've seen too many XJs and Toyotas 
just crumble flat like a pancake when they land on their lids. You know, people think because they have a hard top vehicle that that somehow protects them uh, equal to a cage, but it really doesn't. Like I said, I've seen plenty of Cherokees and Toyotas flop over and, uh, and just crush flat. So that's pretty scary. But even a Jeep Wrangler from the factory with its factory cage is barely enough to survive a roll. So I'm all for a cage when you can afford it. If you're doing buggy things with your rig, a good cage is pretty much mandatory. But make sure it's designed well. You know, learn about nodes so you, you avoid uh, dead-end tubing. But uh, also, you know, a lot of people, they go out and they buy these expensive aftermarket seats for their rig. And to, but, you know, quite honestly, today's factory seats and seat belts are a drastic improvement over what we had in the past. But if you want to add aftermarket seats or harnesses, I don't think it's a bad decision at all. Just uh, don't forget to, well, to wear your belts or harnesses when you're on the trail. Most people who die in off-road accidents aren't wearing seat belts or harnesses. If you do run harnesses, also be mindful that harnesses are a pain in the ass to get in and out of. So a lot of people who install them never wear them and would have been better off just keeping the factory seat belts in their rig. Truth be told, when I was building up my JK, you know, put one tons on it, 42s, bead locks, coilovers all around through the tub in the back, a, a stretch, you know, when I did all this work to it, I decided to put some Mastercraft seats with harnesses in it. And I just got so sick of taking those harnesses on and off on trail runs that I actually ripped them out and went back to the factory seat belts. So, you know, consider that before, consider convenience before you make a lot of these mods. For 99% of off-roaders out there, snorkels are pretty stupid. No mechanic or experienced off-roader is going to recommend a snorkel to you. The only people who recommend snorkels are the companies selling them <laughs> and, you know, noobs trying to justify the fact that they wasted all that money and cut a huge hole in the side of their fender. Uh, probably the, the, the deepest water crossings of any trails in the Western United States is the Fordyce Trail. And, you know, everybody crosses that without snorkels. Probably in a later video in this series, um, I'll cover four by four driving techniques and I'll show you how to properly ford deep water in your rig. Your modern four by four, just like every Jeep Wrangler, sucks in air from above the engine where it's unlikely to get water in it. If your hood is underwater, you're an idiot and the resulting electrical issues and water sucked into your diff and transmission breathers will make a snorkel a moot point. Never cross water that's over your hood. Also, placement of these air intakes naturally keeps rain and dust out of the system because they're under the hood and not exposed to the elements. Snorkels suck in much more dust than these factory intakes ever will. This is also why ripping off this perfectly engineered factory airbox and replacing it with a cold air intake is really stupid. And this next chapter is titled Junk. <laughs> yep, everyone needs to resist the temptation to bolt on a bunch of useless junk to the rig. Leave the roof racks. ARB refrigerators, axe holders, rooftop tents, and angry-faced grills off your rig. Trust me, two-door Jeeps spend a week in the mountains all the time without any of that crap. Real off-roaders know that sprung weight is very bad. The heavier your rig is, the worse it's going to perform. A high center of gravity is also bad, and putting heavy stuff up top on your rig makes it really tippy in off-camera situations. Just like I mentioned with uh, lift kits, keep your center of gravity as low as possible. Some rigs are just downright scary on the trail. So after you add all the necessities to your rig, treat every additional pound of weight you add to it as a bad thing. 
because it is. Resist the urge to bolt on a whole bunch of useless junk. Ah, and I know what some of you are saying. You're going to be like, oh, Desert Dog, my rooftop tent is badass, man. It's so much better than any other tent. It's badass. I'm just going to tell you, go, go down and spend $100 and get yourself a Coleman six-man instant cabin. It sets up in less than a minute. It takes down in a minute. It's got a fraction of the size and weight of a rooftop tent. And it's easier to pack and it keeps your center of gravity low on your rig. Um, unless, you know, you're out camping in the frozen tundra and don't want to set up a tent on the ground, just get a, one of the modern uh, pop-up instant tents. It's so much easier to deal with than the old tents we used to put poles through or even a rooftop tent. And, you know, that big six-person uh, Coleman instant tent, I mean, you could cook your meals in it. Uh, you could put your, your, your porta potty inside of it and not have to go outside to take a dump, you know, in freezing weather. It's, uh, it's really a great option. Yeah. And you don't have to climb up some rickety aluminum ladder to get, you know, in and out of your rooftop tent drunk at two in the morning when it's 20 degrees. So, um, oh, and also, uh, you know, a lot of times I like to set up camp in a place and maybe I'm hunting. And I set up a base camp and I could take my rig out uh, hunting or maybe I'm in an off-road area where I set up my tent and then I go run different trails or obstacles during the day and come back to camp. Well, if you have a rooftop tent, you have to uh, break down camp over and over every time you do that. So not a good option in my opinion. Building a four by four is often a very long and painful process, limited by time and finances. For a lot of people, the longer a build takes, the more interest they lose in it. If you're one of those types, you know, off-roading might not be for you. You have to be honest with yourself about uh, what you want to do and what your expectations of this hobby are. But if you're, you know, jumping into the off-road lifestyle for the long haul, I hope I laid out a solid foundation for your 4x4 build. And I'll state it again, learning to weld and do some simple fabrication work will save you tens of thousands of dollars in the long run. It opens your world up to making your own armor, using junkyard axles, making cages, making brackets, and doing your own suspension modifications. Well, I hope you liked this first episode in my 4x4 Tips for Off-Roader series. Subscribe to my channel to be notified about future episodes like this one. Thanks for watching, and as always, keep the rubber side down.